Hey everyone, this is Mark Ruffalo, and you're listening to News Coup with Public Herald. Thanks for supporting badass journalism. Be sure to join me and the Public Herald team for the virtual world premiere of our new documentary, Invisible Hand. Get your tickets at invisiblehandfilm.com. I hope to see you there. One does not necessarily allow the state to define what is legal. Now, the state has the power to enforce a certain concept of what is legal, but power doesn't imply justice or correctness even. Throughout American history, the political leaders have always exhorted the American people to be nice and quiet and leave things to them. But when very serious evils confronted the American people, they had to go beyond the congressmen and the senators, and they had to commit civil disobedience, and they had even to break the law. You're listening to News Coup, a Public Herald production where we overthrow the status quo. I'm Sam Sanson, filling in for Joshua Prabanik, who's busy editing the documentary Invisible Hand. Today, we're talking about the Pennsylvania Department of Health, or DOH, who continues to dodge health impacts from oil and gas radiation. The DOH mission statement says, The mission of the Pennsylvania Department of Health is to promote healthy behaviors, prevent injury and disease, and to assure the safe delivery of quality health care for all people in Pennsylvania. This mission isn't being completely accomplished, at least through the eyes of Janice Blanick, a Washington County resident who lost her son Luke to a rare bone cancer called Ewing sarcoma in 2016. Here's Blanick. I'm so fearful. I'm just, I'm afraid. Who do we turn to? I really don't believe that there is anyone in the government to turn to. The DOH doesn't seem to be taking concerns from physicians and the community seriously. On June 21st, two local health advocacy organizations, Philadelphia Physicians for Social Responsibility, or Philly PSR, and Environmental Health Project, were able to meet virtually with Dr. Rachel Levine, Secretary of the Department of Health, to advocate on behalf of families regarding a cancer health study in the Washington County area. In the meeting, Dr. Levine revealed that the University of Pittsburgh would be the academic partner to conduct the health study. Advocates for affected families requested a process oversight panel, but DOH denied the request. The study, prompted by rare childhood cancers in the county, will take an estimated three years to complete, at which time the DOH will consider whether it will respond and take action. This timeline allows the DOH to fall back on the unfinished study until 2023, as families wait to find out if fracking is connected to the increase in childhood cancers. Dr. Levine claimed in the meeting that there was a lack of data to determine fracking's connection to health impacts. She said for DOH to react to health concerns they would need hundreds of complaints of the same symptom from a specific location. A recent grand jury report pointed out the fallacy in this lack of data. The report says, quote, our government made no effort to gather the data and points to the lack of data as a reason for not concluding there is a problem. Meanwhile, we know that Pennsylvania families have been crying out to their government and anyone who will listen that fracking operations have made them sick. We heard many of their stories, and we find them credible." End quote. Sarah Rankin is a public health nurse for EHP who attended the virtual meeting. She responded to Dr. Levine's viewpoint in an interview with Public Herald. Crossing this threshold of of evidence, of scientific evidence, doesn't seem necessary when people are experiencing health harms, whether it's one people, one person or or thousands of people. You know, we've talked to enough people on the ground and that's really what the Department of Health is not doing. So it seems negligent to us um, that 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 is their approach on this issue. There's plenty of epidemiologic evidence that living closer to shale gas will increase your risk of many different health outcomes. If an industry is emitting something harmful that's resulting in 
you know, people being harmed on the ground, there at least needs to be a presence on the ground to investigate each situation. You can't just put them into a pile and wait for that pile to get big enough to say, hmm, you know, we better do something about this. Public Herald was told that DOH would leave looking into waste streams and more specifically radioactivity up to the academic partner. There is no indication the University of Pittsburgh will look into the issue of fracking-related radioactivity, despite this being the primary concern of many residents. Questions sent to the university from Public Herald about if the study will determine whether oil and gas was to blame for the childhood cancers have not been answered. Here's Janice Blanick again. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't hear, like, you know, people had cancer. But everybody, every time you turn around, my sister was diagnosed last week with uterine cancer. It's like, it's it's just everywhere, and it, it's just not right. Something's, something's not right. Janice explained she came to a realization about radioactivity and fracking after reading Public Herald's Radioactive River story. Understanding how there's all of this radioactivity in the earth, in that shale, and it's okay there. But when we start pulling it up and, and you know, putting it where we are, where human beings are, it's, it's, it can't be good. It, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. But ultimately, I believe you don't have to be a scientist or a doctor to understand that. It's, it's, it's common sense. You know, you can't live in a radioactive atmosphere and not expect there to be problems like we're having. If you're talking about fracking, you're talking about T-norm, which is present throughout the fracking process in waste streams like pipe scale, sludge, drill cuttings, wastewater, and contaminated equipment. What starts as naturally occurring radioactive material, or norm, contained deep beneath the Earth's surface is brought to the surface by fracking and concentrated into T-norm. Brought to the surface right where families like Janus live. Research has found exposure to high levels of radium is known to cause malignant bone tumors, such as childhood bone cancer. But there are no health studies on radioactivity and fracking. To local families, the horror of making this connection was only exasperated by the fact that both industry and government have known what was going on the whole time and have simply turned a blind eye to T-Norm. Janice said she called and sent emails but never received a response from the DOH as to whether the study would make T-Norm a central focus. Megan Abbott from DOH said she missed the messages and will reach back out. It's just a runaround. That's Dr. Ned Katire a pediatric physician and medical advisor for EHP. What they're doing is they are running out the clock because Governor Wolf is going to be gone in three years and Secretary Levine is going to be gone in three years. And they're not going to have to answer to the study's report. And, and, and frankly, the studies are probably not going to answer very much. They're not going to give any causative data that people might be wanting. You know, you're not going to get any, any causation data. You know, you're going to get more circumstantial evidence, maybe. You're going to get a lot of fluff and you're going to get a lot of doubt. And you're, you're going to have all the merchants of doubt coming out and saying what, you know, what they're going to point to all the limitations because every study has limitations. And it's not going to determine anything. But by that time, the governor is going to be out. It's just not right. Something's something's not right. A series of investigations in the spring of 2019 by David Templeton and Don Hopi for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette confirmed something that had been gnawing in the back of the mines of many residents of southwestern Pennsylvania. There seemed to be an unusual amount of rare cancers in young people in the area. Southwestern Pennsylvania is home to the remnants of two centuries of heavy industry, but now it's also one of the most heavily drilled parts of the Marcellus Shale region. Yet, as Pittsburgh has been named one of the country's most livable cities, the counties surrounding Pittsburgh are now bustling with both young families in housing developments and frack pads 
scarring the rolling hills. The Post-Gazette investigation found 27 cases of Ewing sarcoma in the Pittsburgh area between 2008 and 2018. Ewing sarcoma is a rare cancer that generally only has 250 cases in the U.S. per year. Six of those cases, including Luke Blanick, have been in the school district of Cannon McMillan, a quiet area on the edge of Pittsburgh's suburbs that has been at the heart of the Pennsylvania fracking boom, even housing the regional headquarters of the drilling mogul Range Resources. Numerous other rare cancers in children and young adults are dotted throughout the rural counties surrounding Pittsburgh. Residents in southwestern Pennsylvania, especially in the Cannon McMillan School District, began to organize and call for the state to investigate whether their area has a cancer cluster. The CDC defines a cancer cluster as greater than expected number of cancer cases that occur within a group of people in a geographic area over a period of time. It is incredibly rare for a government agency to declare a cancer cluster. According to the National Cancer Institute, quote, one review of 576 cancer cluster investigations conducted over 20 years found that for only 72 of the apparent clusters could an increase in cancer rate be confirmed. Only three of the 72 clusters could be linked to possible exposure, and in just one case was a clear cause identified. Quote, in response, State Representatives Tim O'Neill and Jason Ortete asked the Pennsylvania Department of Health to determine if there was a cancer cluster in Cannon McMillan. DOH evaluated their cancer registry data and concluded that there was no cancer cluster. A day later, a closed-door meeting was planned with doctors from the healthcare behemoth UPMC and the two state representatives. Representatives O'Neill and Ortete, as evidenced by their past careers, voting records, and campaign finance, have close ties to the oil and gas industry. Meanwhile, local families affected by Ewing sarcoma, including the Blanicks and Bartons, were calling for the oil and gas industry to be investigated as an environmental factor in a cancer cluster investigation. The families were only allowed to join the meeting after the community demanded they be allowed a seat at the table. The representatives then declared they had secured $100,000 to study the genetic not environmental causes of Ewing sarcoma with the UPMC. They also offered free radon test kits to residents. This total disregard for concerns about the growing oil and gas industry in many residents' backyards, as childhood cancer seemed to be growing more and more common, only made residents more impassioned. Meanwhile, that August, Public Herald released its initial Radioactive Rivers investigation which revealed that radioactive landfill leachate was being improperly treated by sewage treatment plants and discharged into rivers across Pennsylvania. The report found that there are 30 landfills in Pennsylvania who are actively storing T-norm from fracking waste. One of the 30 landfills is next to the schools, streams, and county fairground where Ewing sarcoma cases have occurred. The dump site is infamously known as Mount Arden or Mount Trashmore. Arden Landfill, or Mount Arden, in Washington County has accepted 1,297,000 tons of solid waste generated from Pennsylvania oil and gas wells between 2011 and 2018. Almost all of that waste came from fracked wells in the Marcellus Shale, which, according to the best U.S. geologic survey reports and data, has a radioactive signature, i.e. T-norm, consisting mainly of radium-226. Without any health studies about the risks of a community living next to a landfill which stores large amounts of T-norm, one documentary called Atomic Homefront has captured a fight in Missouri over a T-norm waste dump site. In the film, Don Chapman, a mother who started the group Just Moms, says, My message to other moms who find themselves in a similar situation, you have to be your own superhero. It was up to those in the Cannon McMillan School District be their own superheroes, too. In early October 2019, due to the demands of residents, DOH held a community meeting at Cannon McMillan High School to explain the results of their no-cluster determination. Residents called for DOH to include three local young men affected by Ewing sarcoma who were left out of the study, 
Two young men were battling Ewing at the time of the meeting, Mitchell Barton and David Cobb, and one, Kyle Delier, had passed away in 2013 and his address was misrepresented in the cancer registry. DOH never updated their report to include these cases. DOH representatives told the public that while they found an 125% increase in bone cancer prevalence in the area since 2005, there was no reason to be alarmed. Kevin Sensky, a Washington County community organizer, explained the evening, quote, Concerned parents and those who have experienced loss lined up with a series of questions for the DOH in an effort to show that we are not only angry and disheartened by the wall we seem to be running against, but that we are afraid. The DOH told us they wouldn't answer any questions that were not specific to the research they conducted. I suppose this was their way of saying, no fracking concerns. End quote. Janice Blanock explains realizing when something wasn't right in her small community. You know, initially, I never thought anything about the, the cases of Ewing's. There was a boy in our church that we prayed for, Cal DeLear. I just knew he had cancer. I didn't really even know what type of cancer he had. And then, you know, then when Luke was diagnosed, I met a mom at Children's Hospital who still kept in contact with the nurses whose her son had passed from Ewing's and his name was Curtis and he lived right up the road. And still I never thought, wow, wow, there must be something that's happening that's, you know, because they said, you know, this is just a rare cancer. But then when I got the call from my friend that Mitch Barton, a boy that played ball with Luke, that went to the same high school as Luke and you know, I know his family, they know our family. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, there has to be some underlying cause. You can't give me that analogy of I'm going to throw up 200 pennies and some of them are going to land together. I'm just not, that's unacceptable. Um, something is wrong. And um, just just the idea that the government can just turn their head and pretend like, like, um, you know, everything's okay. It's not acceptable. With few places left to turn, residents took to pleading for the governor to hear their stories. On a dark and cold November morning in Cannonsburg, a group of residents and advocates, including the Blanicks and Bartons, who had been affected by rare cancers in southwestern Pennsylvania, got on a coach bus to travel across the state to Harrisburg. The families were told they had a meeting arranged with Governor Wolf to express their concerns. However, when the time came to meet with the governor, the families were told he was unavailable. The families refused to give up and stood in his office wing door, and one at a time pleaded for the governor to hear their stories. Eventually, he came out of a back office door to listen briefly to the family's concerns. Three days later, on November 21st, the state agreed to fund two studies, conducted by an undisclosed academic partner over the course of three years to investigate possible links between fracking and adverse health effects. With this news, local families and advocates were eager to talk to DOH to ensure the study that they fought so hard for would be done with the community's desires and concerns at the center of the investigation. Pennsylvania Secretary of Health, Dr. Rachel Levine, told NPR, Quote, we take the concern expressed by the families very seriously, end quote. In a February interview with Public Herald, Janice Blanick explained, You know, we reached out to, to Governor Wolf and, and, you know, he promised us this environmental um, investigation and we've heard nothing. And I, I was told, you know, we're looking for an academic partner. Um, you know, we'll be working on that in the next month or so. And I reached out by email, I reached out, I called several times, and I've never heard anything since then. I mean, even if you tell me, you know, nothing's happening yet, we're still in the process of looking, but tell me something, like reach out to me, give me some information. Um, there has to be some word, but nothing. So I'm kind of I'm really disappointed. As of July, Blenick had still not received a response from DOH. On June 12th, Pennsylvania Attorney General Joshua Shapiro released the 43rd statewide investigating grand jury report 
on the failure of the Pennsylvania government, specifically DEP and DOH, to protect Pennsylvania citizens from the adverse effects of the natural gas industry. The report stated, quote, Throughout our investigation, we heard Pennsylvanians express a sense that their government failed to acknowledge what they were experiencing because of shale gas operations occurring near their homes and in their communities. Accompanying this lack of acknowledgement was a lack of action, which fostered a feeling of hopelessness and distrust in their government. We find that DOH's response, or rather lack of response, during the rapid expansion of the fracking industry contributed significantly to the pervasive sense of despair felt by so many whose lives were upended and health damaged as a result of industry activities, end quote. As fracking boomed throughout Pennsylvania, DOH created a doomed effort to register fracking-related health complaints that entered a virtual black hole, where nothing was ever done about these complaints, as explained by the grand jury investigation. Quote, the department was not offering answers or solutions to their problems. People were not eager to spend upwards of an hour completing a detailed health survey when DOH had little assistance to provide them in return. We find that DOH's response, or in reality, lack of response, contributed to citizens' feelings of hopelessness and created a lack of trust in the government that should have been interested in protecting them. End quote. Quote, DOH has received an average of one complaint per month since establishing the Enhanced Registry in 2017. As of DOH's last report issued for 2019, the registry includes 164 inquiries related to fracking since March 2011. Of these 164 inquiries, only around 120 constitute specific complaints of fracking activity affecting someone's health. Most of these registered complaints carried over from the Word document dataset maintained by prior administrations, which gathered less data than the current registry. So over three years, the enhanced registry gathered around three dozen complaints, end quote. DOH primarily relies on DEP for referrals of oil and gas-related health complaints. In 54 complaint reports where health problems were explicit, there's no instance of DEP forwarding a complaint or telling a complainant to call the DOH. In the grand jury report, a contractor who administers the DOH fracking health registry testified that, It was perplexing how DEP had received thousands of complaints in relation to fracking activity, while DOH had registered only around 120 total health complaints. There's no single record from the DOH that proves the agency has performed a health-related investigation in the 16 years of oil and gas complaints being reported. Environmental Health Project is a small nonprofit focused solely on the health impacts of shale gas development. They were formed in 2012 in direct response to frontline communities and families needing help and guidance when it was apparent that the government agencies were lacking. The grand jury confirmed that EHP did a better job of gathering health data, addressing residents, and protecting public health than DOH. This shows that DOH did not merely have a lack of resources or experience, they had a glaring lack of will to protect the well-being of Pennsylvanians. The grand jury report concludes, quote, Most significantly, our government, including its Department of Health, does not recognize that fracking operations harm public health, citing insufficient research on the issue. However, the absence of such research, at least in part, is due to DOH's own failure to inquire into the matter over the past decade. This wait-and-see approach facilitates placing the health risks of the shale gas industry's operations on everyday Pennsylvanians. We find the status quo unacceptable. End quote. Quote, We are disturbed by the long-standing approach by our government to ignore or reject information that substantiates the health and environmental harms of shale gas operations. End quote. There's a continuing culture of complicity. Despite the DOH meeting coming shortly after the damning grand jury report, the DOH seems to have made little effort to make it a higher priority to listen to the concerns of residents and health experts. Here's Dr. Ned Katire. It's not a political issue. It's, it's a, a complicity issue. The governor is complicit. Secretary Levine is complicit. Uh, Secretary McConnell and Deputy Secretary Perry 
are all complicit in the damage that has happened to public health. People were screaming that they weren't being heard. And yet there was no change in culture. There was no effort to change the culture in government and to change protocols and policy. There were none. There has been no call for the dismissal or resignation of any of these leaders who've allowed this culture of complicity and therefore harm to Pennsylvania residents to occur at the hands of a major industry. PSR's medical advocacy coordinator, Laura Daigley, says the DOH has dropped the ball. Quote, There is a decade of literature and studies that increasingly show health impacts from fracking. While direct causation has not been proven, an almost impossible thing to prove in environmental exposures, there is certainly enough evidence that already exists to take action to protect residents and follow up on health complaints. Announcing a three-year study followed by stating no action can be taken until the study is complete or X amount of complaints are called into the DOH is negligent. This is at best lazy, and at worst, it reflects a pattern of the PA government to kneel before a toxic industry rather than do everything in their power to ensure the health and safety of the people, the exact task the DOH has been entrusted with. End quote. What does the future hold? We don't know. As Dr. Ned Katire puts it, We're just all waiting. Uh, and, and the people in this community are really worried. I mean, just real parents are really worried. And, and I think that, that um, there's been a failure to appreciate that people are concerned about their health related to this industry and they're just being lied to and they're being uh, gaslit by the wrong people. In a press release between PSR, EHP, and the Center for Coalfield Justice, Heaven Sensky explained, quote, without any promise of actual protection or guidance, the burden continues to be on the impacted communities to advocate for themselves, end quote. Here's Janice Blanick. I would have never chosen to do this, but here I am, and I will continue to speak out if for no other reason than for my son, but not even just for my son, but for all of us, for, for our kids and our grandkids. So here I am, I'm another accident, accidental activist. Public Herald reached out to the University of Pittsburgh, asking if the health study they're conducting for DOH will include investigation into the effects of T-norm and if individual cancer cases will be studied to see if they can be related to oil and gas impacts. The university didn't answer these questions. They did recently respond, though. They said to contact the DOH. That does it for today's show. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the article this podcast is based off on publicherald.org. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and subscribe to News Coup wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support our work further, you can donate to us at patreon.com slash publicherald, which will give you access to Public Herald's documentary work, private interviews, and other exclusive material. News Coup is produced by Public Herald Studios. Today's show was put together by me, Sam Sanson, filling in as host for Joshua Probanik. Sound design and mixing was done by Dream Louder, and the music is from Heavy Color and Dream Louder. Today's story was written and reported on by Kristen Losey and edited by Melissa Troutman, with contributions from our T-Norm team, science journalist Justin Noble, writer Emma Lichtwert, investigative journalist Talia Wiener, multimedia wizard Andrew Geller, communication coordinator Olivia Rasmussen, photojournalist Nina Berman, sound editors Ben Cohen and Sam Waldenberg of Heavy Color and Dream Louder Music, and the map makers at Novair Collective and Frack Tracker. If you have a story to tell about the issues you heard today, contact our team at info at publicherald.org. Thank you for listening to News Coup, where we overthrow the status quo. We hope you tune in next time.